Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I'm excited to bring you an interview that I did with a fellow Australian, none other than Matthew Sharp. So, uh, he came at high recommendation and I now know why, because we had such a wonderful conversation about what it means to live a life of philosophy. So, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Matthew and then we'll jump straight into the show. But Associate Professor Matthew Sharp teaches philosophy at Deakin University and since 2010 has increasingly been teaching Stoic contents and engaging with modern Stoicism. He is working at present on a book-length study of the history of philosophy as a way of life uh, with Michael Yeur, uh, which will appear in 2020 or 2021. He is also the co-translator of the selected writings of Pierre Hedeau uh, with Federico Testa, uh, and also that will be available from May 14th this year, and the link is in the show notes as well. Matt has also appeared at Stoicon, where he spoke on Stoicism and comedy, and the link is in the show notes as well. And he's also published widely on Albert Camus, uh, including a piece on Camus uh, and sorry Camus and Stoicism to mark the 60th anniversary of his death uh, in January 2020. Link below in the show notes as well. So, uh, such a busy guy such an incredible intellect and seriously uh, knows so much about stoicism and what it means to live a philosophical life. So make sure you head to all those links below, find out more about Matt and show him some love and also reach out and let him know how much you appreciated him coming on the show. But without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Matthew Sharp. Cool. Okay. So we are here with Matthew Sharp. Uh, Very excited to have you here. Matthew, and and I appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, we were just discussing before the show uh, how we would go about this conversation, how we'd make it unique for uh, for the listeners, so that they're not hearing the same thing over. And and I really do think that you have a unique perspective. Um, and we kind of discussed this idea of uh, of philosophy as a way of life, something that you're working on at the moment, and not necessarily just picking stoicism and and you know picking this as sort of like an ideology. This is the only way I'm going to live, but but using the the definition that the Stoics kind of gave us of what philosophy is and how it can help us to guide our lives. Um, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective on that, but I just want to give you the opportunity to, you know, introduce yourself to the audience, tell us who you are, what you do, and, and why you've been so interested in Stoicism. Thanks for having me, Simon. Yeah, okay, so I teach philosophy at um, Deacon, as I was saying to you before uh, the interview, yeah, been here for nearly two decades now um about a decade ago i became interested in in stoicism um i'd always been interested in ancient philosophy but within the academy it's sort of more plato and aristotle and then linking in with your your comments about philosophy as a way of life i I, around 28 2009 difficult time for me various things going on and also i attended a course by a colleague at a, at a community school on the work of French scholar Hado, who wrote a book called Philosophy as a Way of Life. And, and I got reading Hado, and, and um, it's just one of those kind of things that can happen in life. Um, you sort of think, oh, you know, I, I sort of, I wish I'd read this 15 years ago. This book kind of seems like it's always existed and it was just waiting for me to read. Mm. Um, and so I had a really powerful response to that. And so by about 2010, I really started to, to, to work on Hado and Hado has a real focus as many of your listeners will know on the Stoics he's written a really wonderful book on Marcus Aurelius and yeah so Hado kind of from about early 70s became interested in, in the Stoics and a lot of his work over the last four decades of his life was on the Stoics but it was centered as you say around this, this conception of philosophy which I think is kind of what I'd been looking for um, I kind of, I think, come to philosophy, like I think a lot of students do, wanting 
something like wisdom. I couldn't define what it was. I kept looking for it. I became interested in psychoanalysis. Um, I sort of journeyed around a, a lot of the history of philosophy looking for something. And then I sort of, as I say, I sort of discovered it in Hado, this, this sort of different idea of what it is to do philosophy. It's not just about, I guess, building really sophisticated conceptual systems. It's not just about writing really neat papers and kind of being, you know, the genius in your class or whatever <laughs> it might, might be um, in some <laughs> conceptions. Um, it's, it's something a little bit more existentially compelling. Mm. Um, and not necessarily sort of separable from the way that you might want to live. It's not something you just do in a classroom. Um, it, as a challenge, at least, it might be something you take outside the classroom into your relationships, into your experiences. Mm. And I, I hadn't been something I'd encountered within the academic experience of philosophy. So when I discovered Hado, it really was... It's like meeting an old friend and I, I think a lot of people might have that experience with Hutto because of the way that he writes. Mm. It was the idea of philosophy um, and, and, and that idea of philosophy is something that is a bit more existentially compelling. It's not just intellectually compelling. Mm. And that, that's the thing, hey, because I think, I think myself included, when I started to get interested in philosophy, it was, it was really once I kind of understood how the Stoics saw philosophy uh, because pre my preconceived ideas of what philosophy were is pretty much, uh, you know, professors focusing most on theory, less on practice, right? And it, it was, it was, it seems like a kind of elitist uh, sort of pursuit. Um, and and when I understood that the way that the Stoics saw philosophy, which was as a way of life, as a as a as a tool to help us to understand how to be an effective human being and how to live a good life that's when I, I fell in love with it. I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is everybody should be studying philosophy. And, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to read every book on philosophy. It just means they have to be deeply uh, intrigued by the question of how to live a good life and how to be a good human. Right. So can you speak to that? Like that, that we, there are a lot of misconceptions about what philosophy is and, and, and like, how, how did you, how did you essentially, uh, change the way that you viewed philosophy once you knew that yeah um i can certainly say you know from, from my own experience um yeah it, it, it was coming into philosophy looking for something not finding it because what i was being given and this has a legitimacy was as you've described it's kind of very theoretical activity um mm. learning about uh great great thinkers um mm. who produced conceptual systems that are you know wonderful works of art and and also you know contain deep and profound insights. And then the sort of the attitude was, what do you do with it? Well, you you write papers and then you become a professional, and then you write papers for other professionals and you go to conferences where you speak to other professionals. And for whatever reason, something about that just always struck me as really strange and mm -hmm. kind of weird. Um, not least because conferences are very much about giving papers and then there's sort of a, a little bit of feedback time in a very formalised public setting. None of it's very Socratic. None of it's like what you and I are doing right now, for example, asking questions, responding mm. to questions. Um, and, you know, in front of a big audience also creates a, a different and I think some, somewhat limiting um, dynamic. So... For me, as I say, it was, it was discovering how I would really change that because you can sort of see it in place where you can see it in Aristotle, but it's not something that tends to be emphasised in the way those guys are taught. But what's front and centre in what Hado identifies and what's front and centre in the Stoics is the sense that philosophy is a way of life, which means that it involves exercises, um, intellectual exercises, but also what Hado famously calls spiritual exercises which attempts to try to say, okay, so now you've got your theory. Um, the theory happens to talk about life. How are you going to bring the two together? Let's not just assume that because you're, you're, you know, you're smart and you can understand this theory that it's necessarily going to do what it's supposed to do because the theory is there to actually inform your existence. And so Hutto began to read texts with the hypothesis that maybe those guys would trying to do different things you know maybe maybe parts of those texts are the practice of these exercises so say Marcus Aurelius maybe those meditations 
as that kind of title suggests, uh, you know, they're, they're written practices that this guy has undertaken, not to graph some kind of a theoretical treatise, not to come up with original knowledge, not to do this or that, but to try and be a better human being. Mm. Um, and the way that philosophy had kind of developed, how to comment, it had meant that we, someone like Marcus just had been really um, kind of screened out of a lot of syllabuses because philosophers didn't know what to do with that. And so I said, well, look, maybe if we change the idea of what philosophy is, we can bring Marcus Ruiz back into the syllabus because we're just going to admit now that he's doing something different. And maybe philosophy was, was um, different back then. And you know what? Even though that it's very old, maybe it can be very new. And, you know, what mm. he would repeatedly say both in interviews and important articles. You know, what strikes me as the most exciting is to make old ideas new again. So mm. to um, get people to read old books, but not to read them as old, you know, as yeah. historians which is important, um, but through reading them with, a, with a, a sense of where they came from to get a sense of what they might mean today. Um, and that was profound for me, and I think it's been profound for a lot of people. I mean, even in 2007, 2008, for example, when I, when I started getting into this, I, I went online and there wasn't a lot on Stoicism online that I could find at that, that time because I was interested in, in practice meditation and so on. But then I jumped back on about 2013, and things were starting to kind of explode. Then again, about 2016, I kind of retuned back into the whole thing and started kind of subscribing to modern stoicism and, and various kind of lists. And, it was, and, and it's become huge. Mm. And I think it's because people have different ways of coming at the same material. Not everyone's an academic who's, you know, dissatisfied with some aspects of academic philosophy, but there's clearly a lot of people out there who are somehow getting access to this material and having a pretty strong instant connection with it. Um, and, 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 and that's as far as I'm concerned. I mean, there are a lot of academics who are very skeptical. I, I, I can't see that that's a, a bad, bad thing. Um, yeah. Well, it seems to be a very good thing, right? That, that making, mm. making philosophy a lot more accessible to everybody. And I mean, that's the power of what we're doing here, right? It's like, you know, people can listen to this episode while they're doing the dishes, while they're working out, while they're driving the car. You know, there's so many opportunities for people to be learning and growing uh, throughout their day now um, that it's, it's becoming almost uh, inexcusable to not be asking those questions about life. Like, how, how should I be the best human that I can be? Um, and... And I'd love to speak to you about that idea of making the old ideas new, because that's essentially where I came to in the podcast as well. I realized, look, there's a lot of people talking about, um, you know, the history of the Stoics or, you know, what they said, um, what this person said, what that person said. Um, how can we actually bring it into a modern context and say, okay, that's what they taught. That's who they were. We know that now. But what was the essence of this philosophy? What was the essence of what they were trying to teach us? Um, so how do you bring those old ideas into a modern age and really make them useful for people today? That, that, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I mean, one of the things I find interesting about Hardo is his kind of line is you've got to read them in their context in order to get what they're, get, get that essence. So you know, we can think about it as, as like, there's somehow an opposition between understanding what they were doing back then and what they might be doing for us now. Hardo's position was, no, no, no. If you can understand what they were doing in their context, what a philosophical school was, mm. um, what were the relationships between teachers and pupils from within professional philosophy today? Understand that and then you can see, well, maybe we can actually translate. So for example, say Seneca with Lucilius, a lot of your um, listeners will be familiar with you know, the moral letters uh, of Seneca to this guy, Lucilius, he's kind of politician. He's clearly got some background, particularly in Epicurean philosophy. And they're conducting a kind of epistolary, that is letter-based exchange, which is, is based around a teacher-pupil relationship which is kind of almost like a life coach relationship mm. it's, it's, we don't get to see Lucilius's letters Seneca clearly responds to letters that um, obviously ha existed so Lucilius is writing to Seneca and 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 he's kind of like a counsellor a, a life coach however you want to put it Lucilius is describing at different points what he's having um 
uh, life situations, life challenges, and literally, and sorry, and Seneca is responding, um, not just as a kind of a classroom teacher, but as somebody who has some intimate knowledge of, um, of his characteristics, his strengths, and his weaknesses, and he's tailoring his philosophical teaching to the particular student um, in order to help that student to overcome their particular difficulties. And over the course of the letters, he gradually keeps introducing more theory, more theory, more theory. But at the same time, you're always coming back to that essence that you've mentioned. So there's a kind of expansion movement in the letters. As the letters go, they get longer, there's more theory, but they're always coming back, yeah, hey, this is a life philosophy. What's in your control? What's not in your control? Mm. Um, what's important, what's not important, uh, when you're reading, how should you be reading, um, what's important to be taking out of what you're reading, um, and, 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 and all of the, you know, the other things that, that, that Seneca is telling with you. So there's this kind of contraction as well. So mm. um, it's a very pedagogical relationship. But, you know, some academics will say, well, that's a historical thing, that's all in the past. And I, my, my response has always been a little bit, commonsensical, maybe a bit rough. That's like, why couldn't that happen today? Why couldn't mm. that happen? I, I, I don't see that there's anything about that relationship and that kind of pedagogical exchange that is impossible. Um, mm. Surely historical situations change. None of us are Roman senators or whatever this list was. But um, we, we have jobs and companies. We have positions of responsibility. We're fathers. We're sons. We're daughters. We're... Um, relations, <laughs> we have friendships and so on and so forth. Um, why is this relevant? I mean, in terms of, of, of that question, I think because Stoicism is talking about those kinds of relationships, those kinds mm. of experiences, it's talking about the ups and the downs, adversity and prosperity, and what do you do with them? Um, mm. I, I simply don't think those questions go out of fashion. I'm not a relativist. I, I agree. And and I think that one of the reasons why that that relationship between Seneca and Lucilius was was so beautiful is because Seneca, he can allow us to get a better picture of of what it means to live with philosophy as a way of life because he put the life into philosophy. It wasn't just all theorizing, right? He wasn't just talking to Lucilius about a theory about philosophy. He was talking about you're dealing with this very real problem. I'm dealing with this very real problem. You know, he said, you know, famously that, you know, I'm just one patient getting well, trying to talk to another patient getting well, right? Like we're all in this together. And what he essentially did was, as I said, he, he put the life into philosophy, which is what it's supposed to be, right? So you're supposed to be able to talk to people about this is an issue I'm dealing with. And maybe I have some experience that could help you with that and some knowledge that would help you with that. And in many ways, I actually think that the modern personal development movement, as much as it's, it's very, there, there's so much crap out there. There's so many hucksters out there, but I think that a few people actually did it right. And I think that the personal development movement is somewhat of a rebranding of philosophy in a way that people can, in a way like they can understand it. Right. Because you go to somebody like, you know, Tony Robbins, for example, you go to one of his seminars, look, yeah, it's big, it's flashy, there's lights, there's dances, all sorts of things that you got all the all the bits and bobs, right. But at the core of it, it's a guy who has his own school, right, uh, his own philosophy yep. for life, sharing yep. that philosophy with other people who are dealing with very real issues in their life, and trying to help them to reach a new level, which is almost uh exactly on par with with what what you would see somebody like epictetus doing right it's like you start a school because you think that you have a method of living life that would be valuable for people the only difference is that epictetus didn't have a stage and lights and you know all of these fancy things but do, do you think that that's kind of like on par with what they were trying to do it's it's kind of like teach people what you think is valuable in life and 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 I hope you can get what I'm saying uh, and not see it for the, the, um, the show of personal development movement. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's important to keep your wits about you when you, you, you sort of, you confront, as you say, there are a lot of kind of um, people out there who, who have the need that 
we were talking about before the interview started that people are evidently feeling out there for kind of for orientation in a larger sense for that's it i mean the way i would put it to my students when i teach stoicism and, and i teach a course on philosophies of happiness um consumerism offers you images of happiness and promises you products and it shows you that these external things are going to make you happy they're going to make you beautiful they're going to give you a beautiful partner they're going to make your neighbors envy you they're going to make mm. you successful and gratified and i think people realize I mean, at different points in their life, I think everybody confronts the possibility that that just doesn't work. Um, And so there is this need, and obviously where there's a need, you know, um, some people will emerge to try and fill that need, and some of them might not be um, altogether, um, you know, um, capable of filling that need. They might be exploiting people and so on. But, I mean, I think think the need is genuine, and I I think that ancient philosophy was very much... um, responding to a similar kind of cultural situation. I mean, it's democratic Athens, it's also Athens in a period of kind of decline of um, a really down set of social changes had occurred over the last 200 years. Um, traditional values were in question as I think traditional values in, in the West have been in question for the last 200 years. Mm. And so you were getting people from Sophists through to, to Stoics who were saying, well, He's away. He's away. Um, and 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 he's a he's philosophy. And I mean, I think one thing that is important to stress, and and people will stress this um, when they kind of express anxieties about about I, I guess using stoicism as a as a kind of a, a life guide. It is a philosophy in the sense that it does produce a big vision. Um, uh, and and the way of life is is couched in that in that larger vision of. Um, of our, our place in the universe of, mm. um, of physics, um, as, as you know. Um, and I guess some, I, I don't have a large engagement with, you know, a lot of the, li- the literature on self-help, but I, I would imagine that a lot of it's bottom up and it doesn't really have that, um, that large dimension, um, a vision mm. of the world and your place in it, um, I think it's, it's important for people to have access to things that are helpful and give guides. But I think what makes a philosophy a philosophy, or at least one of the things, is also that it does give you that larger, that larger vision. You know, um, yeah. why are things that are external to us not satisfying? Um, yeah. Why are they indifferent? What does that mean? Um, indifferent to whom? Um, you know, well, how are they ordered? Then? Are they not ordered at all? Um, mm. and, and stoicism will obviously provide a set of um, sort of doctrines, a set of teachings, um, yeah. that are then brought into the life. Um, so the exercises are related to that larger vision. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it, and that's that's one one beautiful thing about the Stoic definition of philosophy. I just did an, did an episode, uh, actually the first episode on the Practical Stoic Bites podcast, which is all about Epictetus's version of philosophy, which is, you know, it, it has to be wed with action uh, in, in the view that you're going to try and test these principles and see if they affect your life positively. Um, and for anybody who hasn't already turned off the episode in a fit of fury because I likened Tony Robbins to Epictetus, I understand the craziness of what I said, uh, but I hope you can get the essence of what I was saying. Um, but, but I, I don't know about... Tony Robbins' philosophy that, that much. I'd be very surprised if he didn't say things that sounded a lot like stoicism. I mean, I'm hearing a lot from sports people. I mean, this basic you know, the dichotomy of control. It's yeah. clearly, it's making its way into sports psychology. It's making its way into all, all different forms of life coaching and, and I guess, professional coaching. Um, yeah. It just <clears> doesn't necessarily have the label stoic. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm really surprised if uh, some of what Robbins was saying. I don't know his philosophy. Know his well, yeah, it, it, look, he is a very kind of uh, consumerist kind of um, you know success philosophy teacher. It's kind of like you know you can go out there and you can get what you want, you can have what you want, which, yeah, yeah, which is which is fine, kind of right? Thing. But but there yeah. are certain ideas that um, you know, for example, live your life as if life is happening for you, not to you, right? Which is pretty much identical to the idea of love your fate, right? See what you can get out of what life throws at you. Um, and when you reframe your decisions like that, or your, your, your view like that, um, you're going to get more out of life. You know, these are simple ideas that, 
uh, you can see have been passed on from generation to generation and now we have them and they they look like something else but they come from these ancient philosophies but how would how would a person go about starting this process of living their life through the through the uh, lens of philosophy how, how do you start living your life through philosophy you do worse than open up uh, epictetus's manual at step one or, or section one right which mm -hmm. is that dichotomy of control okay so yeah here's the stuff you can control here's the stuff you can't control if you're worrying a lot about the stuff that you you can't control try it and see if it works it's not going to work for you if you redirect that energy on the stuff that you can control, give that a shot. And yeah. and I, I I'm I'm confident that you're gonna you're gonna see some changes and that you're not gonna find yourself as disappointed as as, as you might be. Um, yeah. I mean that, that little manual which is put together by Epictetus' the student Ariane is um it's fantastic. I mean, and, and you know, it's it, it, it's literally that handbook. What is it? Fifty three, fifty four, fifty you know, sections. You can pick it up. You can have it in 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 your, in your work bag. You can kind of just jump in and read a section at any time. Um, but I mean, Epictetus is also really, I think, a good place to start because of that emphasis that you've mentioned on putting the ideas into practice. Um, mm. the most important thing for Epictetus is. What you do with the ideas um, rather than kind of what you think um, mm. it's all very well to have the theory but you really must try and put into action and, and there are various tests that he, he will kind of recommend to you you know go out in the morning um, confront various kinds of people monitor your own reactions and then apply that test am I reacting to something that's beyond my control if 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 I am then I might need to rethink that. What is in my control? Okay, it's how I respond to that. Attend to that and do that and then just do it again and do it again and do it again until it becomes mm. something you don't need to think about doing anymore. And you know, one thing that... Um, I'll tell you a little bit of story about my own kind of philosophical practice, if you mm, like. Please. I, um, I, I, I began... Um, uh, integrating stoicism into a kind of an Eastern meditative practice, broadly speaking. I, I had a friend who was a, a, at that time a Buddhist monk. He's become um, an Orthodox Christian, really interesting spiritual journey. He uh, and I would sit together once a week and then I would sit every morning. Um, and I would kind of, I would, um, I, I'd memorise um, basic stoic principles. And uh, after kind of um, attending to my breath and, and calming my body, I would, I would basically repeat these principles to myself um i got into the the trap of thinking that unless i had a 45 minute period of doing that every day i wasn't going to be a good person or a happy mm. person or, and then kids came along and neither of our kids have slept well and so when did matt used to meditate six in the morning did matt want to meditate at six in the morning when he'd had four hours of broken sleep no so i stopped doing it and and I sort of I started to beat myself up, you know, I'm a kind of a stoic. And where this is going is if you read Epictetus, that's the wrong way to think about it. Yeah. If you use a philosophy, you can do it right now at any moment, because it's about monitoring your responses. It's not yeah. I've got forty five minutes where I'm gonna be stoic and then that's gonna kinda of guide me over twenty four hours and then I'm gonna pop my stoic bucket again and then I you know, and that was kind of how I think about it. Uh, it's yeah. really, no, no, every moment there are impressions coming in um, and there's a possibility of doing something about that, monitoring yeah. how you respond um, and how you're thinking about uh, what do I want, what am I desiring, what am I fearing, do I need to fix that, what am I anxious about, can I control that, um, what strategies might there be to become less anxious about that. And since I've begun thinking about in that way, I, I, I think um, it's become a lot more real and, and achievable. Um, yeah. So you get, you get a very perfectionistic approach. You get up, you spend a certain amount of time and you're going to become a sage. Um, no, not in my yeah. experience. 
you can ask uh, my family members as to how I've gone with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I think it makes perfect sense what you're saying because like you're sitting there for 45 minutes. It might be a good opportunity to reflect. It's a good, it's a good every so often when you can find that time to sit and reflect on a certain idea or meditate. That's brilliant. But in, in the end, you're not, you're not really living in that moment. Right. So, uh, you know, it, what what's what's really beautiful about stoicism is that or just about philosophy in general uh the idea of philosophy is that it should be something that you think about every single day and everything that you do you can meditate on this at, at any point um and you can step out of out of yourself and look at what you're doing from an outside perspective and say well you know how could i be doing this better how could i have more excellence in what i'm doing right now how could i be thinking uh clearer about what i'm doing right now and Honestly, um, I, I, I never meditate and I feel exactly the same way that you do. It's like this philosophy is best practiced while you're living life, while you're doing just the everyday things that you do. And I, I've, I've genuinely come to the point where I think that the, uh, the only way to make lasting change is to not necessarily force it. You know, you, you probably know this from the Eastern philosophies, right? It's like, stop trying mm. to force everything. Just let yourself play with these ideas, right? Like become intrigued with these ideas, step outside of yourself and think, you know, how could I implement these into my career or my relationships or my health, right? And if, yeah. if you think about the ideas long enough and if you, if you listen to podcasts every so often or if you read the book so often, these ideas will seep into your mind and they will just become a part of the way that you live your life, but it takes time, right? And a lot of people want it to happen really quickly. Yeah. But if you don't right. force it, and if you just allow these ideas to come into your life to become the, the, the guiding light, essentially, uh, that's when you start to see real lasting changes, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's another trap that I, I sort of fell into this kind of idea that, you know, I started meditating. So now I'm just going to be, as I say, kind of almost like a sage or something like this. And it's going to be kind of more or less instantaneous. Um, and, you know, again, that's just not the, the way to think about it. I mean, there's a line in Albert Camus, who's somebody I've also worked a lot on, um, you know, happiness is, is, is not a sprint. It's long distance. It's a long distance, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's, 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 it's possible to make a lot of progress in a short period of time, at least superficially, um, um, and to sort of think that you've kind of almost reached the the goal. Um, mm. But the race will continue, you know, and you will slow down, and and you'll you, you'll confront obstacles, you know, um, little boy who, for whatever reason, just can't sleep, um, uh, and then sleep deprivation. In my case, that was the real kind of. Um, John Sellers, who I think you spoke to once, said to me, um, we now know that he had also had a child that didn't sleep. So we now know what the key to happiness is, is a child that sleeps. Um, sleep deprivation <laughs> is a real, a real challenge. Um, because of that physiological dimension, you know, and the stoic monist, it's not, I mean, the, the kind of the interface that you have to affect your being is your consciousness and your ability to, to form judgments, form mm. attitudes and so form positions that is to do stuff but the mind is part of the body and mm. um by changing your judgments and forming new cognitive habits and also new physiological habits i mean seneca talks about fasting for example uh, i know a lot of people in the modern stoic movement and i've started doing this really into the cold shower idea um the body is connected to the mind. It's another really attractive thing I think about about um, about stoicism, and that means also. I mean, the body. I always think of it's like a kind of a. It's like it's like a mule or something. It's kind of stodgy. It's got a real inertial weight to it. It's going to take a lot to change the habits. But once you get into a new inertial pattern, hmm. it's. I mean, I'm sure um, many people can relate to going to the gym, right? If you don't go to the gym for a while, it's really hard to start again. But if yeah. you've been going for three months, it's it's actually a lot easier. Um, yeah. And and, I and even better than that, when when you start seeing results, what happens is you you get even more motivated to keep on doing it, right? Because you see that it's making it making a difference. So it's almost like you you have to understand that from the start, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. 
Uh, but what you yeah. have to do is uh, what they call it in the, in the gym industry is the gym bug, right? You have to get to the point where you catch the gym bug, where you yeah. start saying, oh, my bicep's getting a little bigger or, you know, yeah. oh, look at that. Yeah. I'm getting some thighs, right? And so, and, yeah. and then all of a sudden you see these initial results and because you see those results, you catch the gym bug, which means that you don't go to gym for a few days and you just feel, oh, what am yeah. I doing, right? Yeah. And you want absolutely. to get to that point where you have to move every day because it yeah. makes you feel good. It, it allows you to live a better life. You feel like a better person. Um, and, and that's the same with philosophy, right? It's like this has to become a thought process that happens every single day in everything that you do. And once you get to that point, it becomes addictive and it becomes something that you can't live without. Yeah, and you miss it, and and you feel a little guilty, perhaps. I mean, and and this kind of gym analogy, if we're going to use it as an analogy, it's right there mm. in Epictetus. Mm. You know, there's wrestling analogies. You got to train to wrestle. You got to eat certain kinds of food. You've got to, you know, become immune to to certain experiences of pain and so on and so forth. And athletics is another analogy. Um, you can't get good at athletics, even if you're naturally gifted, unless you unless you train. Um, and every system, it's exactly like that with philosophy. He even sort of says, yeah. you know, people understand that to be a good athlete, you got to train, and then they come to philosophy and they assume that it's like it's not going to be the same. But as far as Epictetus is concerned, it, um, it's absolutely the same. Um, mm. It's just the 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 kind of the wrestling ring is life. Mm. You know, it's not like I step into the ring and now I'm a wrestler. Um, you're wrestling kind of in a sense with yourself um, and, and you know, the temptations we all feel perhaps to, to think in ways and to be in ways that aren't as good as they might be. Um, mm. And, you know, you're a wrestler, you lose some bounce. You're back in the ring next week. Um, one trap I think about the sage model, if you don't think about it in the right way, you know, this idea that, you, you know, unless you're a sage, you kind of, you haven't done anything is, You've got to, I mean, I, you've got to accept the possibility that some days you're not going to do it as well as you want. And you've got to then say, well, I did my best, didn't work. Tomorrow I'm going to do my best and I'm going to get better. Mm, yeah. um, and you've just got to keep getting back in the ring. Yeah, uh, well, that's, um, that's why he talked about um, you need self scrutiny and kindness, right? There needs to be, look, I'm not living good. correctly. Yeah. However, you know, today I just messed up. Who cares, yep. right? It's it's life. Yep. That's what happens. And so yep. as long as you're not too far on the side of who cares and you're not too far on the yeah, side of self-scrutiny, yep. it's got to be a balance, mm. right? Yeah. And, yep. and I think, um, you know, this something going back to what you said about, um, you know, training physically and also training your mind, like I, something that I say to every single one of my clients, it's like, man, you would go out there and you know that you're going to get better results in the gym if you if you get a personal trainer because they know what they're talking about. They're going to, they're going to question your motives. They're going to give you the right advice. And, and not only that, they're going to push you to be better than what you could be if you just went in there by yourself. Yep. And if you think about it, we, we don't place as high an importance on training our mind, right? Like you, you'll spend so much money on getting a beautiful home where you live, you'll get spend so much money on your health and fitness, you will spend so much money in all these areas. But in the end, your true home, the place that matters the most is like right here in your head. Yeah. And so that's why like for me, like books, I want to, even though I, I don't read as much as I know I should, books are one of those things that if I see a book I want, I will not think about the cost, I will not think about whether I should spend the yeah, money or not. It's like, I will buy that. Like that's one I of my guilty I think that's pleasures. A it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I've got a massive um, collection of uh, of books for the same reason. I just I'm a compulsive kind of um, book buyer. But I think you've really expressed really beautifully um, that the fundamental Socratic insight. Um, you know, so Socrates is on trial in the Apology. Uh, he's supposed to have corrupted the youth, and 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 what he says is what you've kind of said there. Well, look, what I've done is I've, I've come into this city. It's very wealthy. It's an imperial city. Um, it's it's um, a trading city. There's people coming to Athens from all around the world, um, or the known world at that time, the Mediterranean world. Uh, all I said to you guys is, look, you're worrying too much about money. You're worrying too much about external stuff. You're worrying too much about status. You're worrying too much about power. Um, all I've said to you is that you can really attend a bit more to, to, to the well-being of your own soul. Mm. Um, and that, that's the first, 
the Socratic ideas I took in my first class, and that's 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 the key. I call it the turning words, the Socratic turn. It's um, attend to what you can control and and um, and the well-being of your soul and self-knowledge, um, and and let the other stuff take care of itself. Um, Stoics aren't cynics. I don't say withdraw from society. You know, mm. don't have a position in society. Don't have wealth. None of that. Um, but have have that wealth under the conditions that you're in control of it, and it's not in control of you. Mm. And you're not dependent on it. You're not um, kind of like a puppet. You know, that's able to be manipulated by by fortune. You know, that's mm. that philosophy that fortune names everything you can't control. Most people, most of the time, because of the way we've been educated, sort of think that um, unless external stuff goes really well, we're right to be unhappy. And the Stoics mm. come along and hack that and say, everyone's going to experience bad stuff. Everybody. Yeah. Even, even the rich, the famous, the powerful, probably especially them, it seems, are going to experience difficulties. It's what you do with that. Mm. Um, adversity. How do, you, how do you bear up to adversity? If you don't have a philosophy that can't get you through sickness, can't get you through the death of loved ones, can't get you through the difficulties associated with raising kids, can't get you through your own mortality, then that philosophy is probably not um, a real portal to wisdom because mm. for beings like us that aren't in control of the universe, we're part of the universe. Yeah. The wisdom that we have that has to speak to everything that happens. And we're vulnerable. We're not, we're not gods. Yeah. Um, yeah. You that, want to have the, really serenity, important what you said of, yeah. the serenity of the gods, as Seneca says, but the vulnerability of a mortal, right? Mm. Um, that'd be, be great to have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think, I think, I think a lot of people are, are trying to play God, you know, um, in the sense that they, they live their life as if they can control everything. And, and, and what the Stoics essentially say. I get that vibe that maybe that Tony sort of, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there, there is the element of like oh, you can go out there and yeah. get it, but there, yeah, there, there needs yeah. to be there needs to be a balance, and that's what I think the Stoics did really beautifully. They said, "Listen, yeah, life life will suck from time to time. It's not going to be easy. As soon as you understand that, then you can start to focus on the one thing that you can control, which is the way that you actually perceive what happens to you, right? And that's such a powerful thing because I actually think that you can, in some ways, determine. Uh, the extent to which somebody is living a life through philosophy by looking at the the level of uh, the level of hardship that makes them furious right so so let 's say the Wi-Fi breaks down and all of a sudden you are just completely you 're furious you 're on the phone i 'm cancelling my subscription I hate it you know like like yeah. if if that 's the thing that that just absolutely infuriates you maybe you need a little bit more philosophy in your life and, and philosophy that teaches you that life isn't always going to go how you want it but what you can control is how you perceive the event and what you're going to do next in an effective manner um and and i think that the farther we move away from that the more we are worried by life and 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 affected by life and as you said earlier uh you know pulled around like a puppet which is essentially yeah. what so many people are today. Yeah, well, one of the, the stoic kind of the good emotions, like there are good emotions for stoicism, is, is a kind of confidence. And it's not a confidence mm. as in I'm going to win a lotto next week or the most beautiful girl in high school is going to kind of date me. It's no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. So I'm going to walk into any situation and it could be god awful, but... I'm going to do the best I can and no one can take that from me. Like this is the kind of the Epictetus line. Like the gods can take pretty much everything from you except how you respond. And yeah. if you can really get that kind of thought fixed in your head, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that stuff's going to happen, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to mm -hmm. steal. I'm not going to demean other people. I'm going to, it's my down. It's not that kind of fall into really negative kind of hateful patterns of behavior. And, I, and I, I, I'm confident I can do that. Mm. Um, 
I mean, I must say that when I discovered this, listen, that kind of thought was what I found really, really powerful. I'd gone through a, a really difficult breakup and I, and, and I had been very bitter and I'd been very unstoic. I didn't know about stoicism. I'd been very, if only this, my partner hadn't gone to another city, if only, you know, she could have got a transfer back, if only the job that I went for in that city had worked. And so I had a whole series of counterfactual fortune screwed me kind of positions. I was, I was miserable and I don't think I was particularly pleasant to be around a lot of the time. And when I discovered Stoicism, I, I found it really empowering because I, I realized I didn't need to be miserable. <laughs> All that stuff just wasn't my call. Mm, that was very yeah. liberating. What, what, what was my call was I can get through this. Yeah. I can get through this. You know, yeah. the sun will come up tomorrow um, and I don't have to be hateful. I don't have to be uh, yeah. I can. I can forgive and I can actually move on and I can try and do better the next time. Very simple. But, you know, this is the idea that virtue is the only good. You know, there's a whole series yeah. of kind of social ideas. They all converge on that fundamental sort of thing. Yeah. Everything else kind of it can be good, it can be bad, but that all depends on how you respond to it. So the good news is that the levers are in your are in your power if you have the presence yeah. of mind for keep returning to them and keep trying to manipulate them in response to what's going on to get the best possible outcome. Mm -hmm. And then forgive and, and perhaps don't forget, learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I, found, I found that anyway, quite, quite, quite empowering. It's funny, nothing can go badly wrong with you. Yeah. Except if you let it, you know, I use the vampire metaphor with my students, you know, you've got to let the vampire into the house. Uh -huh. Otherwise, they just hang around outside. Um, <laughs> don't let that guy in there. He can't suck your blood. And I yeah. think that's, that's what bad emotions are for the Stoics. They're vampires. You can't. Yeah. Don't let them cross the threshold. They knock on the door. They say, you can be angry. You have every reason to be angry. You have every reason to hate. You have every reason not to forgive. And you stand at the door if you, and if that's present mind, say, no entry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Cause they, they will come, right? Like they will be at the door. These emotions will all be there. And, and yeah. you are the intermediary, you know, you're the person who says, uh, yeah, sure. Come on in or not now. Well, the way and that I describe it is kind and, of, and this is the other stoic thing about the emotions. Once you let them in, they will suck your blood. They will. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Control, you know? They will, you know, anger can really, it's like a corrosive acid. And it says it can really, can really hurt your soul can really mm. diminish and i have i have to speak to something that you said earlier like i think the definition of like a like a really a, a good confidence that you feel is is perfect and um you know i have to give an example i i have felt this kind of confidence recently um uh, at the time of us recording this you know i'm, I'm two or three weeks out of of uh, of quitting my or like leaving my position as a gym manager and that was a big risk for me. Like, and, and, and I, and now I realized that the thing that was holding me back was this massive fear of all of the bad things that could happen by taking this risk, right. To jump into something 100% and, and go after it. But now I don't have the steady income. Right. But as soon as I, under, I came to a position where I was like, it's not a matter of if these bad things will happen, they will happen. Like mm -hmm. life has to be up and down. Life has to be good and bad. Life has to be challenge and opportunity. That's just a process of nature. So as soon as you get this into your head that, listen, these things are going to happen, but no matter what happens, as long as I focus on being the best that I can be, doing the best that I can do, I will literally always be intact and I'll always be able to, as Marcus Aurelius says, uh, face this day with the same reasoning powers that I had yesterday and the day before and last year and the year before. And, and that is, that is the true power of living a life in philosophy. It's a true understanding of what really matters and what doesn't. And it's funny because I would have thought that by now I would be extremely uh, frustrated or, or like uh, scared, but what I am is healthily cautious right? And that's what the Stoics wanted. It's like, listen, don't be afraid to move forward and take risks. Just be cautious enough that it allows you to see what could be a threat, navigate those threats by using your reasoning and try to do the best that you can do. And at the end of the day, if that's what you do, nothing can happen that would hurt you because 
everything that happened could be good for you or you just accept it for what it is. And, um, and that's kind of what you were talking about there, right? That quiet confidence. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, it's, it's always worth emphasizing with, with Dawson because some students I find have this misapprehension. It's mm. not, therefore that caution is not, therefore you don't do stuff anymore. You don't engage. Exactly. With the Externals are always there. They don't go away. It's just, it's, it's about that cautious attitude, which is, I'm going to keep trying to do the same stuff that I might have done before I discovered this philosophy. But what's changed is my awareness that there's what I can do and I can mm. certainly try to change things in a way that I, I anticipate as being best, but there will always be the possibility that others won't come along, you know, chance just won't favour things, you know, the market might collapse, all sorts of things. You know, my house might get blown over in a storm, whatever. Um, so caution, but, you know, it, it's still, you're still doing stuff. You're still engaging. You're still, you know, Epictetus says, get married, have kids, get a job. You know, don't, it's, this is not the cynic philosophy, which was become, you know, external goods are worthless therefore withdraw live in a barrel um live mm. like a dog is that what the term cynic means um because all everything else is nonsense the, the stoics are, are more moderate than that in a sense they say well no you know it's, it's not bad to have a nice house it's only bad if it makes you bad yeah um, yeah it, it, try it you know um so long as it doesn't corrupt you um yeah go for it you know mm. um I don't think it's going to make you happy I don't yeah. think that challenges are going to go away you're going to have to meet the mortgage repayments you're going to have to install a kind of security system um yeah. your kids are going to scratch your car they're going to draw texts on the wall which is what my mother my little girl did like two days ago <laughs> stuff, stuff happened she thought it was really funny you know but why not yeah. um you know, mum and dad weren't as impressed, but mm. um, it's stuff. So we yeah. take that down with my little girl and they got out um, the cleaning equipment and they made a game of cleaning it. Yeah. And, you know, that was a nice, you know, sort of stoic response. And all of a sudden it was fun, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the beauty of philosophy, right? Is it, it, it allows you to, not be frustrated what, by what's happening in life, but to accept what's happening in life and to love what's happening in life. Like um, that's why I really do enjoy the way that the Stoics looked at this. It's, it's like, you don't have to detach yourself from society and your community. Like um, if you look at it as a whole, look at it from an outer perspective, maybe yep. there's a reason that all of this is happening. Like maybe there's a reason we have anger. Maybe there's a reason we have sadness or, or grief or, um, pure joy uh, you know there's a reason why people are getting married and having kids and um, you know it's it's all part of the one system of the cosmos right and yep. and so don't hate it like love it dance through life like enjoy life to the extent that you can and try to be the best that you can be because that's all that you can do in this finite existence that we have right yeah and again, I, I just find, I, I do find that, you know, I don't like the word empowering because it gets thrown around a lot in really cheap ways. But I, I, yeah. I, I think that is, if anything is, that is an empowering thought. It's not, you can shut your eyes and pray and you're going to get a Mercedes Benz kind of empowering. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you may not get the Mercedes Benz and you're going to be okay anyway. I mean, that's... Yeah, it's, it's uh, like, if I get the Mercedes, <laughs> awesome. If, if yeah, I don't yeah. get it, awesome. You know, if... Yeah, yeah, whatever, that's it. Whatever yeah, happens, go faith. Awesome. Go faith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, this is another misapprehension that I find students have, like, and friends as well. The is about the stiff upper lip, you know, life is really hard and it's awful, and, and, and you've just got to be really, really strong, like an island of time in a sea of chaos. That's one side of it, but I think that's a partial image. The other side, and you can see this really strongly, I think, mostly in Marcus Aurelius, of all those three great kind of Roman Stoics. The other side of this is a real big acceptance and there is a real sense of the beauty of life and the larger order and kind of um, union of, of, of life. Um, so it's not, it's not just a bit of sort of, you know, you're an island of order in a sea of chaos. It's, it's actually, there is an order. It may not have been created for you. If you're not the center of it. You're part yeah. of it. Um, there is a beauty to it though. Um, you know, that, that, 
what is it? I think it's book three, number two, you know, the, the, the crust of the bread that's been cooked in the oven. Like nobody planned that particular kind of configuration of breaks in the crust. And that and, and that's what makes it beautiful. Like um yeah. or if anyone planned it, it was the gods. Um yeah. you know, there there is there is that kind of um aspect of Thoughts, which I think really does kind of, you know, in the popular image, um, sometimes get mixed, you know, there's there's a big dose of acceptance. Um mm. all the stuff you can't control. Let it go, let it be. You know, yeah. um, it's not just I'm going to be really tough. I'm going to be really tough. It's also, and I'm just going to let a whole lot of stuff not worry me anymore, and trust that it's in the hands of the gods. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's such an important thing to to teach people, and something that I've been really thinking about lately is so many people do really go down that avenue of trying to focus purely on oh. I can control this. Okay. I'm going to control it to the best of my abilities. I'm going to control everything by controlling that. Right. Yeah. I think the massive, a massive aspect of the, the dichotomy of control is a call to, as you say, accept to let go and to say, you know, Hey, some things I don't need to answer. Some things don't need to be answered as much as they need to be enjoyed and, and looked upon with curiosity and looked upon yep. with um, with a certain level of pleasure. It's like, if you can get to the point like Marcus Aurelius did, where you can look at the cracks in the top of a loaf of bread and see the absolute incredible beauty and the majesty of what that is, this process of nature that creates an artwork every time you cook the loaf of bread. Like, <laughs> that, like yeah, that's, yeah. that's absolutely incredible. That's, that's a place to aspire to be at. And you can only get there by essentially... Um, well, you know, there's, there's, there's importance in understanding, but there's also, I think, and this also goes into some links between Stoicism and Eastern philosophy, there is a real joy in just letting go of the need to constantly know what something is or how it works. There's a real power that comes from that where you start to dance through life and, and, and see it as, as Seneca said, as a play, right? Like you're living a play. So why don't you try to be the best character that you can be? Why don't you try yeah. to, to Green Arthur, dance then, through this, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it can be three and a half acts. It can be five acts. It can be seven acts. The, 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 the director decides. The director yeah. decides. You know? yeah. You've just got to play a role. And I, I just keep up on that because it's something I, I, I had sort of really discovered. I, I becoming a father, another really strong aspect of the philosophy that kind of wasn't as apparent to me before I became a father is, is the, the sense of um, playing a role, as you said, but, and that notion of, of stoic duties. Like, um, if you're a father, you know, there's that famous um, in, in, the, in, the, in the manner, it says, well, so your brother has harmed you. There are two handles. Mm. One, he's an asshole. Terrible. <laughs> second, hand, second handle, he's your brother. Mm -hmm. um, I found that immensely comforting as, as a father, and I'm not a perfect father, and, and I do get cross on my kids more than I'd like to get cross with them. I'm not perfect, but what I, I have found really comforting and orienting is that two handles. My five-year-old is having a tantrum. One handle. He's a little shit. He's doing it again. <laughs> when is he? When is he going to stop? Why is this happening? Do other parents experience this? Other handle. He's my kid. Yeah. Um, and that's a really calming thought. It's somehow a really calming thought. So I'm his dad. Yeah. So I'm gonna. I, I've got to be. At the, I've got to be on duty. Yeah. I've got to be there for him. Um, yeah. and when he calms down, we're going to have to try and work out strategies to make it better. Yeah. yeah. And, and when and, you realize that it's a duty, that. right, then you can yeah, say, yeah, yeah. well, it's not about getting angry. Like, like I would with an asshole, right? Like it's yeah. about what does a father do? What is like That's define right, yeah. what is my role as a father? My role as a father yeah. is to not get angry at him for doing this thing, but to allow him to be in a, in, in in an environment where he can learn what the right thing to do is. That's right. And yeah. and so that's not going to be yelling at him. That's going to be talking to him and saying, listen, you know, like, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you how to father, but cause I'm not a father, but you know, like yeah, there's, there's a way to, to perform each role to the best of your abilities. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is comforting just to, it is comforting and it's strengthening just to, to step back from the impulse to be angry and just say, well, I'm his dad. So it behooves me to, to take a deep breath, to, to let this go until he's calm enough and then to try and do something that's positive. But also just the, the sense, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we live in this society where, um, we are encouraged to think of ourselves as very flexible and we can recreate ourselves. And I think it is important with something as important as fraternity and so on to sort of have a sense of duty. Like I, I, I do think that's, it's, it's calming, it's reassuring, it's orienting. There is no out clause, you know, I don't think as a father, there shouldn't be even the possibility. It's your duty. I think Epicurus is spot on about that. Um, mm. so again, it's that whatever happens, I'm going to be there that, that mm. I've, I've, again, I found really quite calming and empowering and no matter if he has a really bad day, we're going to get up and tomorrow we're going to try and make a better day. Um, yeah. and we're just going to keep doing that until I get so old that he can look after me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's no and seriously yeah. the best examples that i've seen of fathers are those people you know and even even my own father you know it's it's when 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 you mess up they're there for you in a really important way they're there for you to to get advice from to to say well you know what what is the best way that i can navigate this because i look up to you and and they're also there in a powerful way that says like uh you know listen i've lived life I can tell you something very important about what you're doing right now. So you've got to listen, right? Like I, I know that it seems from your perspective, like what I'm about to say is not going to be helpful, but I promise you it will be. And if you respect my opinion enough, like, like this could be good for you. And, um, you know, I, I really do. I, I love that kind of aspect of stoicism of, of whatever your duty is, do it to the best of your abilities. And I had an experience recently where somebody uh, emailed me and asked for some advice. They were dealing with an extremely difficult personal uh, decision, one that would affect the rest of their life. And I essentially said, listen, I think the way that the Stoics would look at this is you're going to make a decision one way or the other. That's not for me to say, that's only for you to say, right? But what I can say is once you've made that decision, own it 100%, right? Yeah. If you go that way, own it and never look back, never get resentful that you made that decision. Just go 100% to that duty that you have now. And if you make the other decision, do exactly the same thing. Never look back, never have resentment that you've made that choice. Just do your duty. Just in the same yeah. way that a father should never look back and say, oh, you know, what could I'm my life have been if yeah. I didn't have kids? You know, yeah. like, no, you're a father now. Forget about that do your yep. duty to the best of your ability. And that truly is, and you could probably speak to this, that's a true path to meaning in life, right? Like just accepting that this is what I need to do now. There's a gravity that comes from just being in a situation, as you say, of duty. Um, I've certainly found, I felt like a, a more substantial human being since I've had kids. Um, and and stoicism has helped me in particular, as I say, just, those fragments on duty didn't mean so much to me before I had kids. You know, I just didn't have those kind of responsibilities. Um, but definitely, um, there's a kind of, it's, it's hard to put your finger on, but it, I mean, I use this metaphor of gravity or weight or something. There's something orienting about just no matter what happens, that kind of, it's like that reserve clause, you know. And I'm not saying that this stuff's going to happen. Um, kids are going to deal with bullying. Social media is going to make things very difficult, I imagine, for us in three or four mm. years. When you get to sort of year nine and year ten and the kids start bringing their iPhones to work and they're all on Facebook all the time. And, um, so it's going to be all of that. But one thing I know is I'm going to do my darndest to be there all the time. Yeah. And that social media may happen, bullies may happen, my kids may have you know, bad relationships and go through difficult times. If you can just, if you have that inner certainty, okay, well, I'm just going to make a commitment here. Mm. That, that, that can be really clarifying. It makes life simpler. Mm. Um, it, it, you know, and, and again, there's this idea that starts to make you very, very inflexible, you know, because you are committing to a philosophy. I, I don't know about that. I think that 
it's 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 a way of balancing flexibility and flexibility. There's some stuff I'm not going to compromise on, and that frees me up. Yeah. All that indifferent stuff, I'm really flexible on, because yeah. I know that it, it might not go my way. You know. So again, that's another image I found that students have. You know, stoicism is very be very inflexible and very stern, and very strict, and the stuff and I don't know whether that's that's spot on either because that whole idea that external stuff is out of your control and, and indifferent I, I actually think it really frees you up it's mm. because my, my I'm not unconditionally committed to a certain outcome yeah I'm, I'm a bit more fle- a bit more flexible maybe we can do it a different way for example whether if yeah. I was unconditionally committed then you know anxiety stress yeah uh, and, inflexibility, and, potential anger at anyone who wants to change it, that fortune when fortune intervenes. Yeah. All that shit it it goes easy. back to that idea of like being like water, right? Like, like flowing through life, like, uh, you know, taking yeah. the path almost of least resistance and not, not forcing anything, but understanding that there has to be elements of structure and also play. There has to be structure and also, um, have some fun, like make it up for yourself. That's why I encourage people to write their own personal philosophy. Philosophy like stoicism is, is a guide, but it's not your master. You know, you might, you might really want a beautiful house. Okay, cool. Like at least test it. If that's what you say you want, put it in your personal philosophy and you can always test it and you can change it later if you find that that's not what's going to bring you happiness. But I think um, going well, back to the... Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it it, it 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 really can surprise us, you know. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's that old Mick Jagger line: "You don't get what you want, but maybe you get what you need." You know. Um, yeah. Maybe you won't get that house, and then maybe that will be the discovery. You know, I'm a big yeah. Leonard Cohen fan. You know, there's that um, one of Leonard Cohen's songs. You know, it's basically about um, you, you live your life a certain way, um, and then everything falls apart, and you realise that, that was the meaning. Yeah. What you, yeah. What you next? That's the meaning. <laughs> yeah. That's the mystery. That's the. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people when they hear about this idea of aligning with your duty, they can tend to see it almost as if it's like shackles, right? It's like, well, why should I, you know, just why should I, uh, you know, focus on my duty as a father and not go after my other goals, or why should I like it just accept whatever is right in front of me? Uh, I would, I would encourage people to think of it like this. I, I heard this brilliant quote once. It was like, uh, it was essentially, uh, if you act, dis- sorry, if you act dedicated, sooner or later you will start to feel dedicated, right? And so I actually, I tested that in my relationship um, recently, uh, last year. Um, and I kind of said, look, I'm probably not in my relationship. Look, I'm, I'm not in the place where I want to be. I don't feel the vitality that I want to feel in my relationship. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, like Epictetus would say, like, it's your duty as a husband. You have a certain duty. So figure that out. And yep. I just decided to become extremely dedicated in helping yep. way more around the house, you know, always doing the dishes. Like that was just my job from now on, you know, like, yep. um, you know, helping with as much as I could and being there to support my wife as much as I possibly could. And what I found and what I will continue to do as I move forward, because this is just such a powerful technique is, as you dedicate yourself to something sooner or later, the truth is you will start to feel dedicated and that thing will start to flourish. Right. And, and you just need to understand that there's such a power in letting go and saying, okay, this is what, this is what I'm living with. This is my, this is my duty. Now I have to do it, do it right. That there's nothing else to do. Like if, if you've got that situation, you've got that duty, what else have you got to do other than to try and conceptualize what is the highest possible aim within that structure and then yeah, to go after it? And, you know, again, this, this kind of idea we have, um, my wife and I are big married at first sight sort of, and, and there does seem to be this philosophy, this, this expectation that people bring into those shows that this is going to be easy, it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be love at first sight and it's just going to be whatever. A marriage takes a long time. It could yeah. take a long time. So again, there's going to be that adversity. And, and it, I, I think the, my, my own experience is that my own marriage, we did have difficulties when the kids weren't sleeping because we all, you know, then, you know, things 
weren't happening that might have been happening previously and and the romance basically went we became parenting drones um mm. but we got through that we sought help we got a sleep coach for our kids um and we we stuck at it with it with each other and and now i think our, our marriage is, is a lot stronger and it's more real because it, it wasn't all like it was for the first five years you know, when we didn't have kids and we were carefree and we travelled the world and did all that sort of stuff. That's great. But you do that. But yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if you have kids, things change. Um, and adversity happens. Um, and a relationship gets realer if you're able, I think, to, to stick through it. Again, it's that, that kind of intangible weight of something. Mm. Um, you know, the good stuff, the prosperity is great. Go for prosperity. But... Yeah, don't become there's, dependent there's a on deeper, prosperity. Yeah, there's a deeper prosperity, right? That, that exists yeah, that's like right. in your true home, right? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's all there. I always use this, again, this diagram with my students. I think most people kind of like their, their life, like their happiness chart goes up and down. Yeah. The social wants you to slowly just climb. Yeah. You know, and there'll be little secular dips and, and yeah. but, you know, the, the goal is just you just gradually going to hum, 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 hum. Yeah. As again, I'm really happy. Oh, no. It happened. I'm really bad. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I do think that consumerism uh, is part of the problem. I mean, I think the advertising industry sells us these images. All you need to do is buy something, and that's the necessary condition of happiness. Mm. I'm with Socrates. I've tried it. You know, yeah. it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Life would be a lot easier. But yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Something that I do in my weekly newsletter now um, is actually, I, I call it my preferred indifferent of the week. And the kind yeah. of idea behind this is I'm going to show you one thing each week that one item that I own, one consumeristic item that I yeah. absolutely love, helps me in my life, is valuable to me, right? And yep. the idea behind that is to say, well, maybe start to question, um, I guess, uh, the, the reasons why you would buy something, you know, start to have a certain set of guidelines for how you would evaluate that, right? So in my first news, newsletter, I talked about these Apple headphones, right? And the reason why they are so good for me is because everywhere I go, I can be learning something, right? And so I have these in my head and it's just so easy and seamless for me to be chucking on YouTube and listening to a lecture or, or you know, something of value to me. Yep. And so I think what the Stoics said, which is so beautiful, it's, it's this idea of like, listen, all these things, they're not good or bad, but, but consumerism is this is what's good, right? The Stoics is like, this is what could be good or could be bad. So figure out a process by which you'll actually evaluate that and see how yeah. valuable it is to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, we're not um, always going to be. We're not always going to be young. We're not always going to be in our late twenties, going to the beach with surfboards and drinking Coca Cola or Corona. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, where are the ads with couples in their fifties? You know, um, enjoying meaningful conversation. You know, that, that 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 would be amazing to see those ads. You know. Well, they, I, I've um, seen those ads all the time. It's just they're always talking about life insurance, and it's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Stop seems to be the only please. meaningful they're conversation that over fifties have. <laughs> the virtues are your your ethical life insurance. I I, I use that in in my course. You know? yeah. um, diversity happens. Um, are you insured? You're only yeah. insured if you've got the virtues, if you've got courage yeah. to, to deal with it, you've got the moderation to not flip out, you've got the wisdom to do what you can, and you've got the fairness to, to try and respond to others with, with justice. Yeah. Um, if you don't have those four things, then you're probably going to have some periods in your life which frankly really suck. Yeah. <laughs> and where you're probably going to make those around you miserable as well. Yeah. You know, speaking from yeah. bitter experience. I, th I think Matthew, I think that's the uh, the perfect place to to bring this interview down to an end. Like you know, that's that's what philosophy is. It is literally an insurance for your for your mental uh, well being. You know, and and that's what you're doing every time you read a book, every time you listen to a podcast, listen to a lecture, listen to somebody talking about how to live a good life. You and every time you implement these practices into your life, you are taking out insurance that's going to let you live a little bit better down the line. So um, 
Yeah, Matthew, this has been such a great conversation. I'm really glad that we had this. And, um, and I don't think we even touched the surface of, of the, the, you know, the, how, however much we could have talked about, you know, there's so much to talk about, but I'm going to have you on the show as many times as I possibly can, but thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll be, be always happy to come on. It's been great. Yeah. Cheers. Awesome. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Matthew Sharp. Now, I'm sure you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. And and seriously, make sure you head to the links in the show notes. You've got heaps more that you can read from his writings and his work. So, uh, but I hope you enjoyed that and I'll talk to you guys next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.